on subtyping autism and it got such a great response and so many questions that I thought, well, we just do another live chat and answer um, questions. I won't have time to get all of them because they're just dozens and dozens. But uh, obviously, this is a topic that is very important. And uh, one of the first questions is, why do you think there's been this increase in autism? And if it was just a genetic disorder, um, like Huntington's disease, um, you wouldn't see this wild increase that we have over the last three decades. I think it is a gene, so yes, genes do have something to do with it, environmental interaction. Uh, because our environment is more toxic than ever before. In my new book, Memory Rescue, which you could also think of as Autism Rescue, uh, I talk about toxins uh, and just how pervasive they are in our food with pesticides, hormones, antibiotics, in um, our personal products, uh, shampoos, uh, deodorant, bath soaps, uh, toothpaste. I mean, it's just horrifying to me because whatever you put on your body goes in your body and becomes your body. Uh, also, interactions with air pollution. And then a question we got a lot, uh, which I'll probably get hate mail for, are vaccinations. And, you know, are vaccinations the cause? And scientists have looked at it. And it's clearly not the cause or the only cause. And in large-scale studies, it really doesn't come out as a major cause. But I still worry about thimerosal and mercury and things like that in vaccinations. I'm not a fan of it. I would never give that to my child, and I would never uh, allow any of my grandkids to have it if I got say. Um, Having said that, vaccinations have saved millions and millions of lives. Uh, so we have to really take a thoughtful approach. Um, you know, when they wanted to give one of my grandbabies hepatitis B at birth, I'm like, there's just no way. How do you get hepatitis B? It's IV needles or um, crazy sex. I'm like, you know, we don't need to like deal with that with a baby. Um, so I decrease the numbers of vaccines, spread them out more, and always use thimerosal-free vaccines. So hopefully that's clear. Um, one of the questions we got, actually in a number of different ways, is about inflammation and the brain. So inflammation is a major cause of depression, it's a major cause of dementia, cancer, heart disease, uh, joint pain, and there's evidence that it's also one of the causes of autism. So how do you become inflamed? Uh, you do that by having a leaky gut, so having uh, an intestinal tract that's not working properly, um, or by having seriously low levels of omega-3 fatty acids. And um, our diets are deficient in omega-3. We actually did a study here at Amen Clinics, and we looked at 49 consecutive patients who came to the clinic who were not taking fish oil. And we did their omega-3 ratio. And it's, you know, what's the percentage of omega-3 fatty acids in your blood? It should be 8%. Um, 49 of them were under 8%. There was only one person who was above 8% who was not taking fish oil. And so I'm a huge fan of increasing omega-3 fatty acids in your diet with really healthy fish or taking fish oil. I even get my vegetarian friends to take fish oil. Uh, don't say that. I know I'll get hate mail for that too. But um, you just there's no really great vegan sources of EPA. You can get some sources of DHA, like algae-based DHA, um, but 
it's, it's just really a hard thing to accomplish. So I'm a huge fan of omega-3 fatty acids to decrease inflammation in your brain and body. Another great question on inflammation. If change in food can't help inflammation, what will? Change in food can help inflammation. Our, you know, and I think of many of the autistic kids I see that have a very narrow palate on what they will actually eat. Um, one of my patients said she only ate yellow things, you know, macaroni and cheese and um, grilled cheese sandwiches and pizza and so on. And when I wanted to put her on um, an elimination diet, gluten-free, dairy-free, corn, soy, free diet. She's like, that's oh, nothing I can eat. And I'm like, no, there's about 10,000 things that you can eat. And it just made a significant difference. So if you have a diet filled with sugar or foods that quickly turn to sugar, bread, pasta, potatoes, rice, sugar, those are pro-inflammatory. If you have artificial dyes and sweeteners, they can also be pro-inflammatory. Any processed food. Um, so some of you follow me know that recently I um, adopted two of my nieces and uh, love them dearly. But when they came from Oregon here to California, um, you know, given that I'm buying the food, I'm like, you guys need to go to the store with me. And they're like going for the Hot Pockets. And <laughs> I'm like, we're going to learn to read food labels. And it's, I mean, it's hysterical. Um, you know, one's eight, one's 13. And the, the first grocery store trip was hard for us. The last one was not hard. And they start reading labels and they go, well, I don't understand what this is on the label. It's probably not good for me. Oh, I really love Hot Pockets. They don't love me back, so you're not buying them, right? Right. So um, you have to know what's in your food. All the artificial foods, foods that your grandmother wouldn't recognize as food, they're killing us. And it's part of the rise of mental health problems in the United States. Okay. How does one stimulate the cerebellum? What I talked about a couple of days ago is one of the hallmark features of autism. Uh, and we publish this uh, is decreased activity uh, and size of the cerebellum. That's um, in the back bottom part of your brain. Cerebellum means little brain, uh, has half the brain's neurons, and it's involved in processing speed, how quickly you can integrate new information. I think stimming behavior, um, so flapping and twirling, is a way for kids and even adults with autism to stimulate their cerebellum. So how you stimulate it is coordination exercises. So the more you can get them to exercise, the better it is for their cerebellum, and try to have them do things um, that involves some coordination. So walking is really not much coordination, but tennis, table tennis, um, dance is awesome, um, which is probably why the twirling, because it is stimulating their cerebellum. Uh, sometimes stimulants uh, can help. Um, I tend not to use very much in the way of medical stimulants, uh, for autism unless I also think they have ADD or ADHD, but I've seen using stimulants or stimulating supplements like green tea, rhodiola, ashwagandha, L-tyrosine can also be helpful. Um, another question is how do you get an appointment to be seen at your clinic? You just go to amonclinics.com. Um, you know, I have Natalie put a link for people and you can talk to one of our care centers uh, about that. We have seen well over a thousand autistic kids, so we have great experience. How do you help children with seizures and genetic mutation? Well, that's a question that's very uh, near and dear to my heart because I have a granddaughter, Emmy, who is seven, hard to believe, 
cute as can be. And uh, Emmy was born with a genetic microdeletion syndrome. She actually has a diagnosis of autism. I don't think she's classically autistic, but even at her age, she's not speaking. But at five months old, she started to have wicked seizures. One day, she actually had 160 seizures where it looked like she was being electrocuted. It was horrifying. And when we put her on the ketogenic diet, um, so that's basically very few carbs, uh, her seizures went away. And they literally went away for five years. I mean, it's stunning how important diet is. And if it doesn't work, some of the anticonvulsants are really important. But I think it's critical for anyone who has a seizure disorder um, to decrease the amount of sugar and simple carbohydrates in their, in their diet because the simple carbohydrates raise your blood sugar and then drop it. And it's that dropping it that can actually increase their risk for seizure activity. Um, so what are the various types of autism? So I'd refer you to the live chat I did just a couple of days ago because I subtyped it there. Um, heavy metals, would a spec scan reflect uh, heavy metals in the brain? Yes, it will show up as a toxic pattern. Now, it won't tell us what the toxic pattern is. It just tells us we need to go find what the toxic pattern is. Is it heavy metals? Is it an infection like Lyme? Is it an environmental toxin like mold? What are the odds of having all your children being autistic? Um, that's a really good question. If you have one autistic child, there's a high chance, but it's not a 100% chance. It's more like a 40% chance the next child will have autism as well. And if it's this gene environmental interaction, um, well, odds are you're in the same environment that you were with the first child. Um, my almost 20-year-old son, who's been diagnosed with Tourette's and OCD has never had a brain scan. He's had tested testing, which by reading results, pointed to all making of an autistic child, uh, but he's not. The doctor said he's not. How can they come up with such a diagnosis having never looked at his brain? I, all right, I'm gonna go on a rant. Uh, how can you get any mental health diagnosis without anybody ever looking at your brain based on symptoms. It's been my frustration with psychiatry since I started looking at the brain 27 years ago. It's, it's just unconscionable. Think about it. You have chest pain, what's your cardiologist going to do? He's going to look at your heart. You have back pain, what's the orthopod going to do? He's going to look at your back. You have belly pain, what's the GI doctor going to do? He's going to look at your intestines. Our patients in mental health are every bit as sick. I mean, bipolar disorders and depression are potentially lethal disorders. And yet, 999 psychiatrists out of 1,000 won't look at your brain. It's just stupid. Um, we need to do better. We can do better. That's what we have been trying to pioneer. Now, let me go back to this specific case. When you have OCD and Tourette's, they go together all the time, very common. Um, what we usually see is too much activity in the basal ganglia and the anterior cingulate gyrus. So people get stuck on things and they also have tics. If you watch some of my live chats before, I talk about um, my grandson who has uh, a tic disorder, Tourette's, um, and on magnesium and a probiotic, he did really well. So the first thing is to clean up their diet. Now, never put a person with OCD ever on a paleo or the Atkins diet because it'll deplete them of serotonin and actually make them more OCD. They need a more balanced diet with healthy carbs like sweet potatoes and um, 
medium glycemic index fruit, uh, apples, pears, oranges. Uh, I'd stay away from the high glycemic fruits like pineapple and watermelon. Um, I think it would be great for you to read my book, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, and read the chapter on getting unstuck. Um, okay, next question. What do you recommend for a nine-year-old kid to stay focused in school? Um, so let's decrease all the things that are going to steal his focus, like a carbohydrate breakfast. I mean, you know, when you just think about it, it's so stupid. Um, what do we feed kids in the morning? Pop-Tarts, donuts, waffles, pancakes, sugar cereals uh, with milk, um, really just loaded with simple carbohydrates that spike their blood sugar a half an hour later, and then 45 minutes later, it starts to drop where they get fuzzy headed. I don't know how you feel after two donuts. I know my brain feels like it's walking in mud, but you know, so the first thing I do is I give them a protein breakfast. Uh, I'd also make sure there was some exercise. I would make sure his zinc and iron levels in his blood are good because low zinc and low iron or low ferritin levels are associated with low dopamine and concentration problems. Uh, I'd use things like pycnogenol or pine bark along with tyrosine and uh, certain supplements. Uh, magnesium can also be really helpful and try that. And if all of those things don't work, I'd use a stimulant because left untreated, ADD devastates people's lives. So first do no harm, use the least toxic, most effective treatments. But if those things and you're diligent with them, they don't work then medication can dramatically change people's lives. And on the live chats, I've talked about, you know, my own daughter who, you know, a little bit of medicine changed her from C's, uh, B's and C's, working her brains out to straight A's. Okay. Um, how can you get a brain scan without health insurance? You know, you probably can't. I, I wish it was different. Some insurance companies will cover it. Uh, having known that, here at Amen Clinics, we actually work with a company called Care Credit where you can pay for it over a year. And in that way, it's, it's not a terrible financial burden. But, you know, people often don't think, what does it cost to have an ineffectively working brain? Um, when you think of school failure, divorce, incarceration, uh, financial problems, job problems, uh, you know, parents are often willing uh, to send a child to summer camp for $10,000, but not get them some of the medical help they need. Um, how much can modern medicine really help? <laughs> you know, by modern medicine, if you mean traditional medicine, I just sat with a mom who's a doctor who has a five-year-old son with autism. The traditional um, mentors of this doctor encouraged her not to do any of the integrative medicine stuff. And, and in my mind, I'm like, that has just got to be the dumbest thing given how devastating autism is. I'd be doing all the integrative things to see what works, what doesn't work. Um, I work with a number of integrative medical groups. I love TACA, um, talk about curing autism, or the MAPS group, Generation Rescue, a number of these foundations that are really supporting doctors and families who want to take an integrative approach to autism. Is this a mitochondrial disorder? Is this from heavy metals? Do I, how do I fix my child's gut? All of those things, I think, should be explored and are important. And often the people who say, oh, don't do that, there's no science, is they've never been trained and they've not seen the miracles that people like me have seen by people using. And it's not alternative. That's what I told this doctor. This is not um, woo-woo medicine. This is medicine actually found in the best textbooks. Uh, in the world, but unfortunately, most psychiatrists 
forget their medical training. And when you think of mitochondrial disorder, they just don't have any clue about that. Um, can ADHD go along with autism? And how can fish oil help ADHD kids? And how much do you take? ADHD and autism go together all the time. Many ADHD kids actually um, have an autistic spectrum disorder too. And when those things go together, just giving kids stimulants doesn't fix everything. That they often need social skills training and um, treatments for the OCD part of the autistic spectrum disorder they have as well. Um, fish oil, the studies are very clear that EPA, one of the omega-3 components, is effective to help with focus. DHA is not. DHA helps with more anxiety and memory. So I actually like a blend of EPA and DHA. And if I had uh, an ADHD or autistic spectrum child, I would be thinking at least 1,000 milligrams of EPA and you know maybe 400 or 600 milligrams of DHA uh, to really load those membranes up in the brain. And they don't become fully loaded for five months. So you need to be patient with the supplements. I mean, you know, some of our drugs, I mean, they like, like Ritalin works right away. Uh, many of the supplements you have to be patient with and uh, take over time. Can autism be cured? It depends on what's causing it. For some people, the answer is no. When I see some of the devastated brains, we could help make it better. Is it going to be cured? No. Um, some kids, and when you go to meetings like Generation Rescue or talk about curing autism, you'll actually hear stories of how children were severely autistic. And as adults, they can be a bit quirky, but no one would be able to tell that there was a problem. It's just, it's clearly worth investing in knowing as much about your child's biology as possible. Um, why aren't all autistic children required to get brain scans? <laughs> I'm a fan of scanning anybody whose brain is not working at an optimal level. Now, people go, but you're biased because you own Amen Clinics. And well, why do you think I own Heyman Clinics? Because I think it will help uh, people do the best they can. Um, I didn't become a doctor because I wanted to make money. I became a doctor because I wanted to help people. And it's just unconscionable to me if you have technology that can help people understand what's going on with someone who has a devastating disorder. Well, you should do that. Um, how can you help nonverbal, very low functioning, severely autistic and OCD person? Well, I think it starts by looking at their brain so you actually know what you're dealing with. And um, when I think of nonverbal, I think of some integrative, uh, really cool therapies like hyperbaric oxygen uh, to help increase blood flow. I think of um, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Sometimes that's been shown over the left frontal lobes in right-handed kids to help stimulate speech. Uh, I think of, of course, healing their gut. Um, what are my thoughts on neurofeedback to calm the ring of fire? Uh, I'm a huge fan of neurofeedback. It's quite a commitment. Uh, and if you can get the child to cooperate, that's really the, the limiting steps. For some people, it can be incredibly helpful. Um, OK, I've taken up a lot of your time. We will continue. You know, Keep sending in your questions. And if you have a question about your specific situation and you want to perhaps talk to one of the doctors at Amen Clinics, call our care center. We can tell you about the services we offer here. Thanks so much.